I was at this one school and um, the class was getting ready to go outside for recess and so I was helping all the children get their coats on and <laughs> zipped and buttoned and all those things and this one little boy, <clears throat> he had a little hoodie sweatshirt and it was freezing cold outside and I had a little hoodie sweatshirt and I said, okay, you need to go get your coat on. He said, well, this is my coat and it was just was that, you know, that that was really my first taste of, um, oh my goodness, there are children who, you know, who don't have winter coats. You know, again, I, you know, that afternoon I, I talked on the phone with my mother and I called her and I said, Mom, I don't know if I can do this. This is heartbreaking to me. I mean, I was, you know, crying and I said, this is just so challenging. I, if it's going to be like this every day, if I'm going to feel this sad every day, I don't know if I can do this. And that's the moment that my mother said to me, this is exactly why you need to be a teacher. My name is Whitley Fees and I'm 28 years old and I live in Glasgow, Kentucky. Um, life was great growing up here. I have um, great parents, um, very supportive, loving family. I had a wonderful childhood. My mother and father um, were just so loving and so tender and they raised me um, just to be um, a good lady. Growing up was always fun. My mom was a stay-at-home mother. Every night before I would go to sleep, we, when she would tuck me in, um, we would say prayers, and she would always read me um, a good night story. Um, just listening to her voice, it just was always like silk, and um, she really instilled a love for reading and literature whenever I was very young. I can still hear her voice reading my favorite stories, and of course she always let me choose, and most of the time I would choose the same, probably three or four books, but she would read them every time with a smile. and. Like it was the first time we'd read them. One of my favorite memories about my dad is um, he would just play anything that I wanted to play. We had tea parties, we, he would let me cook and he would eat our pretend food and um, one of my very favorite memories of him is he would lay on the floor and let me play beauty shop and put all of these little um, hair pretties all over his hair. I grew up Across, living across the street from my Nana and Poppy, who were my mother's parents. I have a lot of memories with them as well because we were, we lived so close, we were able to spend a lot of time um, with our Nana and Poppy. Every afternoon after school, I would go over and visit, and Poppy um, taught me how to play rummy, and we would eat Cheez-Its and drink tea. He just was such a good, such a good man, um, just very loving and, and kind-hearted, and um, I just really enjoyed the time that I got to spend with him. My Nana, um, she's very much like the worker bee, like she just never sits down to rest. She's constantly um, wanting to do something and take care of something or clean something or whatever. She would rock us and she always had these long pretty fingernails and she would tickle our face while she would rock us. And um, my cousin Kesley and I, <clears throat> when we were little, we were really close in age, just a couple years apart and we would um, argue over who's over who got to sit in her lap. We would literally try to like push the other out so that we could um, get in her lap and that is on home video somewhere. And my granny is my father's mother and she was the grandmother who, we were her only grandchildren, Gabe and I were, my dad's an only child, and she pretty much let us get away with murder. Whenever I went to college, I did not plan on being a teacher. Um, I had high school teachers, uh, Miss Britton was one and Miss Macy. Um, they both told me, oh, you're gonna be a fantastic teacher one day, you're gonna be a great teacher. And I said, I have no interest in being a teacher, that's not what I want to do. When I went to college, I had planned on being a, um, a pediatrician. I wanted to go for pre-med. And <clears throat> that was my plan. That's what I always thought I wanted to do. And when I got to college, um, I think a lot of people kind of do this too. They get to college and they kind of think, well, there's a lot more out there that might be a better choice for me or that might suit me, um, suit me better than what I've always thought I wanted to do. So um, <clears throat> I took lots of different classes 
and um, found myself in the introductory class for education. And with that class at Georgetown, um, we had to do teacher assistant hours, and I was placed in this um, elementary school in Scott County. And it was, I mean, it just clicked like the very first day that I went. Um, I was helping the children, and I was able to work uh, with a small group and doing some one on one activities with them that the teacher had planned for me to do. And I remember going to my car. Um, as soon, before I even turned my car on, I called my mom and I, I said, Mom, I know exactly what I want to do. I know exactly what I need to be doing and it's being a teacher. Um, so from that point on, I didn't question it. I just feel like this, you know, this is what, um, no, this is just what fits me best and this is what I feel like um, God has called me to do. So. I feel very fortunate to teach in the school district where I work. Um, we as a staff and faculty, um, we pray together and we're able to share our faith with each other. Um, of course, you know, not it, it's not anything that everyone has is made to come together to do, but when a um, fellow faculty member is sick or they have a sick child or you know something major happens we meet as a, as a staff and join hands and we pray um, for that we pray at the beginning of the school year um, together we you know anytime that we have any sort of you know event or gathering um, prayer is always a part of that um, me personally before I um, start a school year and I I have that list of those children's names who have no idea who they are, <clears throat> most of them. And uh, I begin praying for them and for their families and for our time together and just for um, God to use me in their lives for whatever, in whatever way that, that I need to impact them, that God just helps me and guides me um, to be what they need me to be. My very first year of teaching, um, I had this little boy, and his nickname was Lele, and just precious, like just a precious child. Well, he was very stout, and <laughs> I remember um, he would, it seemed like he would always wait until I was bent down to tie a shoe, and that's when he would decide he wanted to hug me, so I would be bent down on the floor to tie a shoe, and he would come and just hug me, and literally would roll over like he we would roll in the floor because he was so stout he would knock me over and we would roll and and he did that just all the time I had a little girl in my class I'm pretty sure it was my third year of teaching and um, she had a very very strong personality um, very much like the children's book character Junie B Jones it was the very first day of school and the children were doing an activity at their tables and this little boy comes running up and he says, Miss Feast, Cassidy said a bad word. <clears throat> and I said, okay, well, whisper it in my ear, tell me what she said. Because we all know that sometimes bad words are like stupid or, you know, I'm not even going to say the <laughs> other ones, but, um, you know, or shut up or, you know, sometimes they think that those are bad words. But so I called her back to my desk and we were speaking in private, of course, not to embarrass her in front of the others. and. I said, Cassidy, did you say a bad word? And she said, well, yes. And I said, well, what did you say? And she said, well, you had asked us to sit at our tables and do our work. And Grayson was being so bad. He wasn't doing what you asked us to do. And I said, okay, so what did you say? I don't really say it because it really is kind of, that's a bad word. <laughs> okay. She said, well, I just told him that if my mom was here, she'd bust his ass. And so, of course, I had to have that conversation about how I can't say that word at school. And and she was she was kind of like the wild card. I had her actually had her two years in kindergarten, um, and uh, she very much uh, she would say whatever came to mind, whether it be appropriate or not appropriate school language. And I mean, even as far as like my my boss, our principal, she would she would say <laughs> she would repeat what she said to. To, um, our principal and so of course she was the one that everyone just grew to love and just very hilarious. One day I had a child bring their cat to school in their backpack so <laughs> that was interesting. I mean 
or so many funny things. But. <laughs> so I had to call their parents and say, um, okay, so your cat is here at school. Okay, teaching has affected my personal life in the way that I guess I kind of feel like I don't have a personal life anymore. Um, and I think that's just part of being grown up too. Um, you know, when you have to get up at five o'clock in the morning, you can't stay up until one o'clock in the morning. Um, you can't get four hours of sleep and then come to school and, and be what the children need you to be during the day. So um, I, I feel like I'm very much a boring adult. I go to bed by like 8.30, 9 o'clock, and uh, you know, I mean my weekends are my time to do um, what I need to do. I was going to say some people have told me that I'm very serious about life and I have that teacher, uh, what's the word, that teacher, um, I give off a teacher vibe, and I don't really know that I completely understand what people mean, but I've had several people tell me that when they look at me they can tell I'm a teacher. Part of teaching is is entertaining. You have to sell the material to the kids. I mean, they have to want to listen to what you're saying, and they have to enjoy what you're presenting to them and what they are doing, um, or else they're not going to learn. And so, um, I guess in a lot of ways, I've kind of become a little bit more animated with my um, nonverbal, like my facial expressions, and um, I use my hands a lot, and kind of like my whole body because I'm when I you know, read a story or talk about sneaky E or whatever it might be, um, I very much have to entertain the children. I try really hard. I think a lot of times early childhood teachers, like preschool, kindergarten, um, first grade even, <coughs> sometimes we're guilty of um, using our teacher voice when we are um, with our family and friends. Another thing that I've caught myself doing um, I call my children in class, I call, we're all friends. And so I will say, okay friends, today is Tuesday, our special is art class, we're gonna learn about, you know, whatever it is. And uh, so sometimes I will like say, okay, come on friends to like, you know, my, I mean, I guess really my friends, but it, it's the way I would say, come on friends or hello friends, you know, to my kids at school. So sometimes those phrases will carry over and I catch myself and I'm like, oh, you're not at school. <laughs> stop, stop using your, um, you know, teacher phrases. My first year of teaching, um, my eyes were really opened up to um, part of life that I, n I had never really experienced. Um, I don't even know that I ever really knew that that existed. I mean, I guess, in my mind, I knew that there were people who were less fortunate than me, but <clears throat> I had never really firsthand experienced it. Um, not really. And um, when you see those children who come to school with no coat and it's freezing cold outside or no socks on their feet, um, dirty faces, their hair hasn't been combed, um, <clears throat> those are the moments especially my first year of teaching, um, that I realized um, how blessed I was as a child to have parents that always took care of me. And, um, and that's part of life that's really um, hard to accept or swallow, that these children who are so helpless, um, they depend on, on their parents for everything. And when parents don't do for them what my parents did for me or what we what I feel like parents should do um, it's it's very heartbreaking I had a little girl in my class and uh, it was a day that we I think that we had a delay that day um, it was snowy outside there was slush and ice on the roads and <clears throat> She was a little girl who kind of had to fend for herself. Um, you could tell she had to take care of herself as far as like combing her hair and getting herself dressed and all those things. You can you can just tell. And um, when I got to school that day, another teacher came and she said the little girl's name and she said she's in your class, right? And I said yes. And she said, well, this morning I was driving to school <clears throat> and I saw her in the middle of Columbia Avenue. And Columbia Avenue is a, a very busy road in our town, especially 
um, in the mornings at, for the school commute. Um, all of our schools are pretty much, you know, out Columbia Avenue, and so she lived in a mobile home um, community, clo pretty close to school. Um, she and her sister, who was in second grade, had gotten up, and I guess they realized that no one had woken them up for school, and um, come to find out they had tried to wake the adult who was at their home, and the adult wouldn't get up, <clears throat> and so they decided that they were going to bring themselves to school that day. They thought they had missed the bus. They knew they were late, so they decided to bring themselves to school. Well, they had made it into the middle turning lane um, of, in, on Columbia Avenue, which they'd had to cross two lanes of traffic, and then there was another two lanes to go. And um, when this teacher drove by, she saw them standing there. Of course, a second grader is about seven years old and then a, a five-year-old. And so she pulled over <clears throat> and got them in the car with her and brought them to school that day. And there was slush and snow probably mid-calf or so on me, so to their, probably up to their little knees. When she got to my classroom that day, underneath her coat, she had on a, a sleeveless tank top. She had no socks on her on her feet, and she had little capri-length pants on. So she had put tennis shoes on, with, and um, you know it, it just was devastating because it was just freezing cold outside, and she was dirty and cold, and just um, it was just very sad. I've experienced that there are a lot of parents who. Um, look to me for the the parenting answers. Um, I don't know what to do with my child. Um, you know, what you're seeing at school is what I see at home and I'm not really sure what to do. And so <clears throat> it's, you know, it's kind of the opposite of what it was when I was growing up. Or, you know, I feel like my generation, the way we grew up, especially me personally, um, my, my parents backed the teacher. You know, the teacher said, this is going on and I knew, like if I got in trouble at school, I knew that I was gonna get in trouble when I got home and, <clears throat> You know, and it's not so much really like that anymore. I mean, you have the the families, you know, the few and far between families who are like, who are that way. Um, but it's definitely the minority now. You know, a lot of times you have parents that really are just not really sure how to handle, you know, their own children. And I don't know if it's, you know, through a fear of, well, if I spank my child, I could get in trouble for this. Or if I do that, you know, I'm not really sure where the, you know, where the, what the change was, what, it, what happened. Um, you know, <clears throat> one thing is, is the younger generation um, now, our, our parents, um, you know, my, my parents were in their mid, late 20s when they had me, and now I have kindergartners and their moms are early 20s. And so I think just that, you know, maturity level um, as, a, as an adult, as a mother, um, it's just different. It looks different than it did, you know, when we were growing up. and and most people waited until later in life to start families and you know people are starting that earlier now and so I think that that has an impact as well just the maturity level of the parents. I still feel like I'm very much a new teacher, a young teacher. Um, five years in you know some people look at that and like oh if you've got you know you're in your fifth year and that is a while but I still very much feel like some days I feel like I'm playing school you know I still feel like you know, that, that young girl who is, you know, just was starting. There are times when I wonder, well, what would my life be like if, if I would have chosen differently? Where would I be if I had decided to, you know, go into something just totally different? And, um, and then you have those little, those children who look at you and, and they just say, Miss Visa, I love you. And thank you for taking care of me. And, you know, I've had children who, um, I always greet my children in the mornings and tell them goodbye in the afternoons and we hug and a lot of my children we um, will tell each other we love each other and, and I mean that is a genuine I do love them as if they're my own. I don't have children of my own yet and um, I do love them as if they're my own and um, so I will tell them I love you, have a nice afternoon, I'll see you tomorrow and um, you know when the, when the children are the first to initiate that or they'll raise their hand to tell me that they love me. Or, you know, uh, just knowing that you are making a positive impact on their life and that you are a good, a good part of their life when a lot of them don't have a lot of good. Um, I've had children ask me before, can I go home with you and you be my mommy and you take care of me? And that lets me know that, you know, I'm doing the right thing. 
as little as they are, you know, sometimes you wonder what what do they really get out of what I'm doing? Are they really, I mean, yes, you can see they're making progress. They now know 15 letters when they only knew three, or they know they can count to 100 when they can only count to 20. I mean, you see academic progress, but <clears throat> when you see um, that emotional um, progress and you see um, just how much they value um, your opinion of them and and they 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 care what I think you know and they want to um, they want to to make me smile. A, a teacher, a fellow teacher who um, is a very much a veteran teacher, um, she wrote me a note back towards the beginning of school, <clears throat> and she wrote about how and of course she's taught for probably 30, 30, 31 years, and she wrote me a note that said, when I think of you. I think about love. I'm reminded that um, I need to take the time to enjoy my children. I need to make sure that they know that I love them. And I, when I think of you, I'm reminded that I need to be intentional about that. And um, at the end of the note, she wrote um, with, um, it, it's a quote, I need to go get it, I've got it on the side of my phone, okay, uh, with great wisdom comes happiness and love I think and so she just wrote about how that's what she sees in me as an educator and as a teacher is that happiness and love and I genuinely do love what I do um, I genuinely love my children that I um, am fortunate enough to spend my days with and um, you know to me that that's just the most humbling and um, you know just the most um, Sin, like the sincerest of compliments for a veteran teacher to say, I've learned this by watching you, and I've learned this, you know, through knowing you. And so um, those are the moments that I'm reaffirmed. At the end of every day when I reflect um, on my day and just generally reflect about um, where I am in my life, I am I'm thankful that I chose to be a teacher. Um, I, I very much feel fulfilled. I just really, I can't imagine myself doing anything else. I definitely chose, um, chose the right thing for myself.